member, car guy in chief, the class winners collector vehicles, and today I'm in a mid 60s domestic convertible that was ironically named for a race in which it would never compete because it was for sports cars. And this vehicle has constantly been forgotten like a middle child against its stud fraternal twin brother with a larger engine and platform mate cousins. But you know what? It's awesome! To really understand this 1967 Pontiac Le Mans convertible, you really have to go back, well, many years. Back to 1961 with the Pontiac Tempest. The Pontiac Tempest was built on the GM Y-body platform. That was a compact platform. And it was designed for this emerging compact market that brought the Ford Falcon and the Plymouth Valiant. The well, GM's take on it was to take the Pontiac Tempest and give it this upper trim range, the Pontiac Le Mans. Tempest Le Mans. And what made the Tempest Le Mans somewhat unique in the lineup is it actually had independent rear suspension. That was to accommodate the Trophy 4 cylinder engine with the torque tube transaxle. So pretty cool. Problem is, is that, well, sales weren't that good for any of the compacts that Detroit had to offer. So for 1964, they went mid-size and put the Le Mans, Tempest, and the forthcoming GTO, as well as the Buick Special and Skylark, and the Chevelle, Chevelle Malibu from Chevy, and the Oldsmobile Cutlass, and then 442, all on this more traditional frame in a live axle rear mid-size platform. Now, as I alluded, just like the Le Mans became a trim package to the Tempest and then spun off as its own model, in 1964, the Le Mans had its own trim package. Well, actually, it was a performance package called the GTO. And that was John DeLorean's marketing genius to put a 389 in a mid-size platform. And he could even get tri-power carburation. Pretty cool. Now, GTOs are fundamentally the same thing as a Tempest and Le Mans, just with, well, different engine and slightly different springs and shocks, but otherwise, it's the same car with different trim. But you pay sometimes three or four times as much for that GTO name. And is it worth it? <laughs> well, let's tell you more about that. In the badge engineering glory days of General Motors in the 60s, it's really funny to talk to people how the olds Cutlass and 442 handled better, and the, or the Buick was more of an executive hot rod, and the Pontiac was more just straight performance. In reality, they're all, they're all really the same, and you know, except for the fact that the Chevelle is about eight inches shorter, they all, the rest of them, are about within, oh, two and a half inches of each other, and all right on an identical 115 inch wheelbase. So it comes down to engines. The funniest thing about engines has nothing to do with big power. It's actually that in 1967, 
In the Pontiac Le Mans, you could get a Sprint 6, which was the only overhead cam 6 available. But otherwise, all the engines from all those manufacturers sharing the A-body were overhead valve, two valve per cylinder, you know, V8s in various different sizes and with various different carburation. In 1967, the, the 400 was the standard for the GTO, and you could get this 326 V8 as an option in the Le Mans. acceleration with the big muscle cars you know the ss396s and the gto 389 tri-power but the Le Mans in 1967 with the 326 was actually not a bad performer the engine it's a 250 horsepower two barrel and actually, this has a four-barrel conversion on it. When you're talking acceleration numbers, it's like talking to old guys about fish they caught. Cars have gotten faster over the years without getting faster over the years. You see, it all started when car and driver tested a Cheater GTO in 1964 with a NASCAR big block in it. And the fact of the matter is that it could never duplicate those numbers. But in actuality, these cars were about 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds, and the GTOs in their best forms were 0 to 60, really honestly, in stock trim, about 6.5. Because, well, the tires weren't that good. And that means that my daughters can get in their 15-year-old Toyota Avalon and run door-to-door -door with the most lauded and first muscle car on the planet. But the thing is that you're not always drag racing an old car, so it comes down to a lot of different things, like comfort and feel and seat of the pants. And in 1967, the Pontiac Le Mans was a great, well, light muscle car with good cruising power. You got great instrumentation. I had a tachometer. We have bucket seats and a center console, floor shifter. I mean, even in 1967, you could get a GTO with a two barrel and a column shift automatic that made, oh, something like 265 horsepower. So, in a way, this is a performance bargain because you pay a lot more for a two-barrel GTO. Controlling the 326's power is a two-speed power glide. Now, you could get different transmissions as an option. You could get manual shifted cars, three-speed and even a four-speed. And in the GTO in 1967, you got a turbo 400 to handle all the power if you got the automatic, and that was a three-speed unit. Power Glide's a fine transmission, it's just not the best. So how does the Le Mans do against the GTO or the Cutlass 442 in terms of handling? Well, there's really nothing much you can do with a 206 inch long, 115 inch wheelbase, live axle domestic car from the 1960s. I mean, it handles like a domestic car. Uh, get your Novocaine shot to your hands and try to pick something up. That's what the steering feels like with this very typical domestic power steering. It's it's not dangerous, it's just it's just kind of well numb. 
Now this specific 1967 Lamar actually handles a lot differently than the stock. On the positive side, it's got far larger wheels and tires. On the negative side, well, we've got an issue with the suspension bushing, specifically up on the front driver's side, upper control arm, where one of the bushings is actually missing. So the wheel is kind of rocking around front to back and up and down, and really causing an issue in handling and in braking. You know where it's gonna go. It's still enjoyable, but to think that this vehicle is actually named after the 24 hours of Le Mans, where all the best handling sports cars of their day go to prove their valor, yeah, probably not the correct name. And obviously, Pontiac would make a career out of naming cars for races they didn't compete in like the Trans Am, which had an engine that was too large for the Trans Am series. Keep this statistic in the back of your mind. In 1967, they sold, I think it was 6,820 of these convertibles. You know, the Le Mans convertibles. In 67, so much for being so much rare, they only produced 250 fewer GTOs than Le Mans. So this is just as rare and desirable. Hey, if you got the means to buy a GTO, you want to spend somewhere around 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars for a 67 GTO convertible, and knock yourself out. I just think that just like the Buick Special, the Oldsmobile Cutlass, the non-SS Chevelles, the Le Mans is 98% of what the GTO is. Yeah, it's a little slower, but who cares? You're never really flogging on it that much, and it's all about the cruising experience. And I tell you, on a beautiful day, I mean, it's mid-October, and you got the top down, and no coat on. It, you just want to smile. This car makes you smile. And you can bring four of your friends along to smile with you. I'm all about that.